he got a slap on the wrist and he's still in business. And so um, I think that I've, uh, I have two minutes? Oh, great. Um, you might hear in the media, and this is what the industry tries to say over and over again, fur is back. Um, that's not really the case. Uh, the fur industry peaked in um, 1987, and they had, it was a $1.8 billion industry. It's kind of dipped down to $1.2 billion, and it's sort of been stagnant at that level for a long time. Um, but we have to stay vigilant on this campaign. It's a very winnable campaign, um, and the, um, you know, they, they have, they're constantly reinventing themselves to find new markets and demographics. A lot of the fur industry has moved to China, and it's been said that up to 80% of the world's fur comes from China now. Recent investigations in China show horrific abuses. There's absolutely no laws protecting animals in China, but the laws in the US and in North America are not working if there are any laws anyway, and there are no federal protections in the US either. So, um, but in China, we have seen video evidence of horrific abuse, um, animals literally being skinned while they're still fully conscious, um, dogs and cats being used in the fur industry, and this is a, a fairly recent investigation where we saw um, dog and cat fur, which is banned in the US, being brought in anyway and snuck in on fur trim because garments under $150 don't have to be labeled, um, which is, uh, there is a, in the works, there's a federal law that will hopefully close that and, and make it mandatory for all fur garments to be labeled. A law in New York just recently passed to that effect. Um, so I have on my handout also some, some other common myths that you'll hear um, when you're protesting fur, so I encourage you to pick up the handout and um, I'll be available afterwards for more questions. And thanks a lot for your attention. I'm Elaine Close. I'm with CAT, the Coalition to Abolish Animal Testing. Um, we're a local group that we mostly focus on OHSU and their primate center, but we also work on educating people in general about the issues of animal research. Um, so I'm just going to give a super basic overview about vivisection or animal experimentation or whatever you want to call it. Um, about 100 million animals a year are used in experimentation in this country every year. As a very rough estimate because for reasons I'll go into a little later there's no way to really know. Um, animals are vivisected for a variety of purposes. Some of the main ones are education which most of us know about, you know, dissection um, used as training tools for doctors. Although the good news about that is that out of 126 medical schools in this country only 10 now use animal labs to train doctors. So that's been an extremely successful campaign against that practice, and people are realizing it serves no value whatsoever to train doctors in that way. Um, of course, it's, animals are used in product testing. So of the thousands of new products, you know, household, personal, cosmetic products that come out every year, almost all of them are tested on animals. Um, and those tests consist of eye and skin irritancy tests and toxicity tests that involve ingestion, so whether that's um, forcing animals to ingest these things or to inhale them. Um, and this is all under the guise of safety. People have this idea that animal testing of products, household products, cleaners, makeup, whatnot, is to keep us safe, but it doesn't actually keep products off the market. Um, what it does is it gives a whole bunch of data ab about at what point um, a certain product causes damage to the animal. So, for example, the infamous LD50 test, which is the um, toxicity test for um, ingested toxicity, they just figure out how, many, how much of a given product it takes to kill 50% of the lab animals. So that doesn't really tell us anything about the human using the product, doesn't keep it off the market, it's just a bunch of data and it provides some liability protection for the companies that want to sell this product. Um, and of course, they're used, animals are used in medical experimentation, which is mostly what um, our organization focuses on. Um, so the defenders of animal research want you to believe that animals in labs are protected by law from abuse. And there, there is indeed a law that's supposed to protect lab animals from abuse, the um, Animal Welfare Act. Um, but there's a lot of problems with that. Uh, for one, it's not, it's very rarely enforced, um, and that's something you can talk to Matt about if you want more information about that. 
Um, he was also a whistleblower at OHSU's primate lab, and when he came out with information, he came out with a USD inspector who said, I wasn't allowed to do my job. Um, the other problem with it is that it doesn't cover very much, and there's no amount of suffering that you can inflict on an animal that can't be justified and made legal. So things like if you accidentally st you know, let your animals die from lack of water and they happen to find out about it, maybe you'll get a fine. But if in your experiment it's, you say that it's necessary to deprive the animals of water, then that's legal. Um, so really any amount of suffering is okay if you can say it's necessary for your experiment. Um, the biggest problem with the Animal Welfare Act, which is supposed to protect lab animals, is that it doesn't cover birds, mice, or rats. Um, I guess by the law those aren't considered animals. So and since 90% of lab animals are mice and rats, it's, there's, it's not a, it, it does nothing to help those animals. Um, and that's also why it's, there's really no accounting on how many animals are used, because since they're not covered by any law, even our publicly funded institutions like OHSU don't have to tell us how many animals they're using. Um, they would, animal researchers and their defenders would also like us to think that there's layers of oversight that make sure that um, research programs aren't approved, that aren't worthwhile, that everything is, you know, thoroughly uh, scrutinized to make sure it's, it's useful and relevant work. Um, so there are layers of oversight, but the problem is they're corrupt. It's basically animal researchers and those with vested interest in animal research rubber stamping the programs of other animal researchers. There's no real questioning of the validity of these things. Um, and I think if, you know, I can't go into that too much because of the time constraints, but if anyone wants an example of how this isn't working, this layer of oversight system isn't working, we have Judy Cameron. Um, she is a researcher at OHSU's Primate Center. Um, primarily doing behavioral studies. I'll give you just a few examples of the things that she's doing that we're paying for that are supposedly approved to make sure they're important. Um, she's doing maternal deprivation studies, the same kind of garbage we were doing in the 50s that we didn't need to do then. Um, and supposedly she's shown, um, and I'm getting this from her own words, that when you deliberately orphan a baby monkey, if you give it a surrogate parent, that it will do better than a monkey left orphaned. Um, and there's a quote from her in the Oregonian, when the Oregonian presented this like some big breakthrough, that um, this might be relevant for humans and show that orphan children should get uh, surrogate parents like foster parents as soon as possible. So this is the kind of breakthrough coming out of the Primate Center. Um, she's also doing a study that's supposedly going to teach us about um, depression and anxiety in adolescents. And she takes adolescent monkeys and plants large hardware heart monitors under their skin and their backs, flies gliders over their heads, and then measures their heart rate. And so she's figured out that some monkeys are more timid than others. And this is supposed to teach us about children. Um, just an aside, I'm a social service worker. I work with children with depression anxiety. It's not really going to help. Um, having services would help. Um, but that's another, that's another issue I'll touch on a little, in a minute. Um, Oh, so she's also trying to see if, in general, infants who receive greater social support are less likely to develop anxious and depressive disorders than infants who receive less social support. So this is the kind of stuff we're torturing monkeys for and that we're paying for. Um, so a super quick overview of the arguments against animal research. There's, of course, the ethical argument that it is cruel, and that is undoubtedly true. Um, I don't have time to go into any of that. Um, and also the argument that we don't have the right to inflict this suffering on animals for our purposes. Personally, I choose to rarely talk about this philosoph or to never talk about this philosophical question, because I think there is no philosophical question about animal research. If we were curing cancer, if we were curing AIDS, if we were helping children with depression by torturing animals, there might be a philosophical question. Do we have the right to do this? But the reality is animal research is not helping people. It's not curing cancer, it never will. And I, I found over the years of learning about this that it's really doing a lot more harm than good 